yeah, so I'll kick us off and uh, um, say just a couple of words for introduction. Uh, welcome to the uh, session on disability inclusive client responsiveness. Uh, my name is Valentina. I'm technical specialist on client responsiveness at IRC. In the next uh, 45 minutes, we will be uh, focusing on uh, um, sharing the experience uh, that we had at IRC uh, on improving uh, inclusiveness of our programs uh, through equal access to feedback mechanisms. And uh, before we dive uh, deeper and look more into the details of this topic, um, I'll just want to uh, have a quick stop on the housekeeping rules. So um, as you mentioned, or if, as you see already, uh, you are joining the session with your mics and video uh, off. Uh, so we will invite everybody to unmute themselves in the end of the session for the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, comments on the session, please use the uh, chat option um, on the uh, event platform, on the CHS Alliance uh, event platform, where you also joined uh, the, this current session. If you have any technical problems on, the, um, on connecting to Zoom or um, any other issues with Zoom session, please use the Zoom chat for that. Uh, and we'll definitely, uh, our, our team on MYT team will address them. And I uh, really uh, like the reason why I would like to welcome you to use the chat uh, box um, in the CHS event platform is because we will be able to address any comments and questions after the session is over um, while the Zoom chat, we can't be able to access it anymore. Um, so um, quick word on the closed captioning, uh, maybe Russell, if you can walk us through this uh, setting, that will be great. Yes, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back uh, for another session. So for this session, we do have uh, some closed captioning uh, in, in here. So you'll notice at the bottom of your Zoom app, there should be the option for closed caption. If you click on this, it should then give you uh, a little bar that pops up and where there should be the option to show subtitles. If you click on this, <coughs> sorry, you will then see um, subtitles appearing on the screen uh, as the speaker talks. <coughs> there can be a slight delay of about three to five seconds or so. And so please just um, take that into consideration. Um, but yes, the captioning should work for, for you to, to read if you're having trouble hearing, um, or yes. So, um, <clears throat> for that, just to go through that again. So there is a closed caption, uh, button at the bottom of the screen, please click on this and it should give you another option to say, show subtitles. If you click on show subtitle, you should then see the closed captioning on the screen. Perfect. Thank you, Valentina. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Russell. Uh, that's extremely helpful. We're really happy to have the closed captioning uh, option for this session. And again, if you have technical problems uh, assessing this set setting, please uh, drop your question in the, in the Zoom chat and the team will be able to support you on that. Um, without further delays, uh, just really being very cautious of the short time that we have uh, available today um, for the session. I'd like to move us forward with uh, uh, introducing uh, us to the speakers today. Uh, so uh, it will be me, Valentina. As I mentioned in the beginning, I am technical specialist on client responsiveness at IRC. Uh, Kevin, um, our colleague from Tanzania, is also joining us today. He is a senior manager, senior protection manager uh, working with IRC in Tanzania. And uh, Alice, uh, our uh, senior technical advisor on um, inclusion. Uh, so just to take us further um, on the objectives of the session, uh, Alice, over to you. Thanks so much, Valentina. And, and um, a real warm welcome to everyone who's joining us today. We really appreciate you, you giving up your time and excited to share with you all um, yeah, some of the learning from ISC's work on, on a disability inclusive client responsiveness. 
Um, what we want to do today is really start off with thinking about a rights-based approach to accountability mechanisms. I think that's a really important um, area to, to start off with. Um, it's not necessarily an approach that those um, maybe working on accountability are familiar with, and then vice versa, those of us maybe from an inclusion, disability inclusion background aren't so familiar with some of the um, nuances of accountability mechanisms. I don't know if there's... Uh, I'm getting a bit of feedback from somewhere else in case there's any possibility to mute others. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, first of all, we'll look at a rights-based approach to disability inclusion. Then, then we'll take a look at highlighting really ISD's gaps that we've seen in our current approaches. And then we wanna take you through some more detail about really you know, what we've been seeing in terms of the, the successes of adaptations to our accountability mechanisms to allow for this increase in, in, in inclusion to those um, to those approaches and, and mechanisms. We're going to draw on some experiences from our colleagues in North Syria and Tanzania. Um, and as we've mentioned already, we'll have um, a, a great presentation from our colleague Kevin on, on really how the team in ISC Tanzania has experienced this, um, this project and this work. And then finally, we'll touch on institutional, uh, how we're going to hopefully through this project, strengthen institutional and global standards, um, thinking about tools and guidance that we're, we're developing within the project to really um, push forward on this vital participation of persons with disabilities in, in accountability mechanisms. Next slide, please. So let's, um, yeah, we wanted to take a moment to really unpack this concept of a rights-based approach and, and what that means when you apply a rights-based approach to disability inclusion in um, accountability. Um, this is an approach we've taken at ISD to this work and we've found it to be you know, really critical importance to our work under this theme. It's helped us to really push forward, I think, push forward again towards what, what we really, really a meaningful way in which persons with disabilities can interact with our accountability mechanisms in a safe way, in an autonomous way, in a dignified way, respectful way. And I think um, for all of us in the project team, we found that this approach has really, really pushed us to, to think beyond, I think, I think sometimes in humanitarian approaches, we can consider, you know, reaching the majority of the population is good enough. And I think when we take a rights-based approach to this work, we see that that's not good enough. We need to be thinking about equal access for all um, on an equal basis with others. Um, so when we think about a rights-based approach, we are thinking about full, equal enjoyment of human rights, um, to put it simply, um, for persons with disabilities, older persons, for, for all. Um, and I think this approach helps us to really think about inherent dignity, um, and also equality. So we, we want to think about non-discrimination for persons with disabilities within accountability mechanisms, rather than just thinking about, okay, this is a, this is a service that we deliver and how can we ensure access? It's, it's about ensuring that non-discrimination. It's thinking about the human rights, the inherent human rights of that person. It also, um, you know, I think it pushes us to think about ensuring that rights are upheld and not inadvertently restricted. I think that can happen a lot in accountability mechanisms. We, in, we, we um, inadvertently um, restrict rights through um, you know, old processes that we might follow through not really thinking about the lived experience of a person with a disability who's, who could or might be trying to access some uh, form of accountability mechanism. And then finally, um, yeah, I just think holding this constant in our minds that, that persons with disabilities are rights holders and we must think about how we can um, constantly engage with our work considering disability inclusion as a human rights issue and no longer thinking about, um, as I say, this, um, this idea that when we reach the majority of our, of our clients, of our population, that that's good enough. Um, so we wanted to just use that as a framework really to take us through all of the presentation today and you'll see us touching on bringing to life um, this rights-based approach throughout this presentation. So then 
a brief word before I hand back to Valentina on, on really what this project, um, give you an introduction to this project. Overall, our, our objective here was really addressing critical barriers um, and advancing access for persons with disabilities in our humanitarian services um, on an equal basis with others. Um, thinking about humanitarian services and the kind of entry point for thinking about access to humanitarian services being our accountability mechanism. So I just wanted to flag that for everyone that, you know, I think accountability mechanisms can be this vital entry point to think about access to humanitarian services writ large. Um, and so if we get the access right uh, around accountability, that can kind of unlock access across our humanitarian services. So the potential for impacts really high, I think. Um, so a bit on the methods we've used here. Um, we conducted an in-depth scoping study between 2019 and 20. Um, the scoping study um, included um, a number of key informant interviews with ISC staff, also with external stakeholders. Um, we also conducted focus group discussions with frontline ISC staff um, and crucially focus group discussions with also clients with disabilities to really inform um, our understanding of the gaps and the, the, the issues that persons with disabilities were having currently facing ISC's uh, um, accountability mechanisms. We also um, drew on a advisory committee, which we, we wanted to highlight here because I think it's been a vital part of the project. Um, the advisory committee was comprised of uh, first and foremost organizations for persons with disability, um, but also both peer mainstream and disability specialist INGOs, research institutions, and, and of course also um, organizations working on accountability like CHS. So together, this, this group of experts has really helped shape uh, and drive this project. And um, in case any of, of those advisory members are here, a great thank you to you all for, for how you've helped us so far in this project. So using the scoping study data, using all of the, the, the understanding that we gathered through this process, we then started to turn our attention to thinking about how can we develop adapted um, tools, data collection tools, and analysis methods guidance guidance uh, as well to help us think to improve how uh, accessible our accountability mechanisms are at ISD. And I'll hand over now to Valentina, who's really going to firstly go into more depth about our client responsiveness approach and, and then take us through, along with Kevin, understanding what these adaptations have been and, and really what critical impact we're seeing them having. Thanks, Valentina. Thanks a lot, Alice. Uh, yeah, quick overview, uh, short and very, very, very clear for us uh, to continue the discussion. Uh, quick stop on uh, client responsive programming generally, just to bring us on the same page. If you have heard about the approach before, if it's you, um, new approach for you. Um, so basically what we have are been working at IRC is to uh, identify the organizational uh, approach, uh, organizational policy to accountability, community engagement, and uh, participation, the topics that has been discussed, uh, addressed in the, uh, already for a while in the humanitarian uh, sector. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, we develop an approach and applying it throughout the whole uh, project life cycle and generally our approach to programming is to make sure that uh, programming is client responsive, responsive when our clients are engaged and in influencing the decisions about its design and delivery, and it can be breaking down into uh, several uh, practices and actions. So we make sure that we systematically listen to the perspectives of our clients and use their feedback to make decisions. And we close the feedback loop with them. We communicate and explain to our clients how their feedback has informed our actions. And uh, again, this uh, approach has been informed by different global standards. Um, and uh, apart from the actions, we also are uh, focused on uh, enabling conditions uh, that we identified uh, in our client responsive programming. Uh, you have been, uh, the more detailed um, approach is, is described in the uh, background information that uh, 
was shared on the CHS event platform. You can have access to it after the session as well. But more generally, uh, we have been focusing on well-functioning feedback and response mechanisms with very clear referral pathways and data management system. In the internal conditions, we have been working on organizational culture that values participation, accountability, um, have supportive senior leadership uh, and uh, uh, dedicated human and financial resources to that. External conditions that are very important to enable uh, this work are is, uh, around donor flexibility and requirements on accountability and community engagement, and a very important interagency collaboration and information sharing between organizations operating in the same context. Um, for the equal access to feedback mechanism, we have been looking into our two uh, building blocks. Uh, so basically the uh, universal design accessibility of the feedback mechanism that we uh, develop and uh, reasonable accommodation when we look into uh, particular uh, barriers that needs to be addressed on the case-by-case -case, uh, scenario. Um, what we have learned from our scoping study that uh, Alice mentioned in the beginning is uh, uh, generally to uh, also look not only into the practices that we do, but um, into our work with the uh, IRC staff in different contexts. So as a first uh, gap that we have identified through the scoping study is the need to deepen and improve understanding of the rights-based approach to uh, disability. So we are better able to design accessible accountability mechanisms and client responsive programming in general. Um, we learned that there is a need to make a very uh, informed and uh, decision um, on data disaggregation. So make sure that we really uh, do what we preach around data disaggregation on disability, sex and age. Um, we need a tool for regular assessment of safe, safety and accessibility of feedback mechanisms to make sure that we identify the barriers, enablers and risks that uh, our clients experience when they try to communicate with us. Uh, and uh, a huge focus or like a bigger focus will be made on identifying programmatic changes related to accessibility to uh, collect lessons learned or specific methods uh, based on the experience from the country programs how to make uh, our programming more accessible. Last but not the least is of course, improved communication with clients with disabilities. We cannot uh, spend enough time, stress enough uh, the um, importance of uh, focusing on communication, different communication channels, uh, diversify the uh, information sharing uh, feedback mechanisms available for our clients. Uh, based on this, we will be focusing in the upcoming year on developing some particular tools along with uh, improving our everyday practices. So uh, what we'll be developing further is the uh, safety and accessibility audit for uh, service mapping and uh, feedback mechanisms, proto protocols on accessibility and reasonable accommodation, including the easy to read forms that should be available and used uh, throughout different uh, communication and engagement practices that we have uh, uh, adapting and uh, making better use of our um, guidance and training materials of Washington group questions and data disaggregation and also uh, adapting uh, existing uh, guidance and training materials for staff uh, on inclusion, non-discrimination, intersexuality and rights-based approach to disability. Um, so far on the practices and the lessons learned from the country programs. When we do invest in different areas of work that we have just mentioned, we really have a uh, better grasp of the ongoing situation to make the analysis of the preferred communication and response channels that we have in different settings. So here we have the example from the Northwest Syria. So by investing in different enabling conditions and practices that we have mentioned, we are able to look uh, better into our ongoing practices and improve our communication with persons with disabilities. Um, so as you see in the situation of COVID, we uh, have been able to make the comparison and improve the access of persons with disabilities to the feedback mechanisms uh, through diversifying our information sharing, using more instructional videos, 
uh, sharing related information through WhatsApp groups, SMS channels, and more remote channels. Uh, where we share sign language videos, broadcasting voice messages, and uh, uh, information in plain text. Um, so uh, just in the recent months, we have observed uh, better participation of persons with disabilities that has increased from 8% from our overall population to 25. Of course, there might be other reasons behind that, um, but uh, definitely diversifying information sharing has been a helpful approach. Uh, on the feedback channels uh, that I used mostly, especially in the situation of COVID, uh, but even before it was a lot on the remote communication through WhatsApp and before COVID, we relied a lot on the help desk, but nowadays uh, it has been uh, really due to COVID regulations and restrictions, not possible anymore. So the use of the remote communication through uh, WhatsApp and SMS uh, has been increased uh, drastically. Uh, we observe also improved uh, connectivity with uh, our female clients um, through more remote communication channels, um, as well as a better participation of uh, persons uh, uh, internally displaced uh, as well. On the information that has been shared back to the clients, uh, so the response channels have been also moved a lot to the remote communication through or WhatsApp groups and or email, uh, as well as um, internal referrals to the program staff. And we observe uh, more feedback around a request for assistance and uh, a bit less on selection criteria and more request for additional information. So really uh, hearing better and being uh, better positioned to uh, here, our request for assistance in the ongoing remote operation has uh, improved our possibility to communicate with people in the remote setting. I will now uh, give a floor to uh, Kevin. Uh, and uh, due to connectivity, we pre-recorded his presentation. So uh, I will take a second uh, just to change the screens and share his uh, presentation with us, uh, as well as uh, his uh, pre-recorded video. Um, I'm sorry if we are rushing a bit through these slides, but I just really wanna make sure that in the end of the session, we have uh, uh, enough time for Q&A. Um, and we will also use Slido for this one as well. Um, so without further delay, I will now, uh, that playing the uh, the recording uh, from Kevin from Tanzania on the disability inclusive plant responsive programming that has been applied in Tanzania country program. Major protection and rule of law. I work with the International Rescue Committee and I'm based in the Kasulu Northwest yes, of Tanzania. Sorry, I can you make I... the video full screen for us? Thank you. Uh, you mean the video from Kevin? Yes, please. Um, yeah, but then I won't be able to show you the slides. Okay, do you want me to share the, the video from Kevin? Because I've got it ready to share if you need me to. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, no worries. So I can go. So the slides, the side of the slides, is it? So you should be able to see I'm about to play the video. Senior Manager Protection and Rule of Law. I work with the International Rescue Committee and I'm based in Kasulu, northwest of Tanzania. So the RC in Tanzania implements both in the refugee camps and the host community. Um, and uh, in the refugee camp, we have three refugee camps that we implement in and the surrounding host community in Kigoma region. Um, so for both the camp based and the host community based programming we have been using um, both proactive and reactive feedback channels to um, receive and provide feedback to persons with disabilities uh, and for the proactive feedback channels we've been using focus group discussions with different groups of persons with disabilities boys separately girls separately men separately and women separately We've also been using individual interviews, uh, community meetings and uh, consultations 
with persons with organizations of persons with disabilities together with their networks. Uh, for the reactive channels that we've been using and we continue to use uh, are office walk-ins where people walk into IRC offices, facilities in the camps and out of the camp. Uh, we have suggestion boxes strategically placed that are accessible to persons with disabilities, including children with disabilities. We have IRC toll-free hotline, uh, emails and SMS lines that are open and are operated by IRC staff. Um, so, of course, feedback is also shared with staff through routine interactions during implementation when staff are in the field implementing. And along the way, we've been able to identify different challenges and address them. Um, uh, one among them is that, you know, we've had a challenge of uh, disaggregating data in terms of type of disability. As you know, there are different types of disabilities. So having data disaggregated in terms of persons with uh, visual impairments, persons with mental um, health needs, persons with uh, physical disabilities, persons with hearing impairments, this has been um, a challenge because we have always also wanted to um, uh, understand what are the partic participation needs of people with different disabilities as opposed to, you know, generally aggregating data for persons with disabilities. So, of course, um, the use of multiple accessible formats, uh, such as uh, large print for people who have low vision, uh, easy to read and plain text formats that are accompanied by diagrams or pictures for persons with um, intellectual disabilities, uh, and usage of tools in local languages. Uh, so to, uh, several adaptations have been made of these feedback mechanisms. And, uh, you know, when we were uh, developing these feedback mechanisms and doing the adaptations, we've had uh, some level of, you know, very significant involvement of uh, different uh, stakeholders. So that includes uh, IRC staff and partner staff, because as I mentioned, Earlier, we are working with organizations of persons with disabilities. So we've been working with them to co-design, test, and implement um, uh, these uh, and analyze communication channels uh, in consultations with these partners. But also clients have been involved uh, through focus group discussions held with different groups of persons with disabilities, as I mentioned earlier, in different groups of men, women, boys, and girls, uh, and using local languages. So, of course, a lot of time and resources have been plowed into you know, into um, the efforts that have been made by IRC staff and local organizations of persons with disabilities and um, involvement of government counterparts um, in order to, you know, get the necessary requisite approvals because uh, it's it's quite difficult if without, you know, local government um, approvals. So this has um, really impacted on the way we uh, we uh, communicate and involve persons with disabilities in uh, providing and uh, receiving feedback. And for clients with disabilities, there has been uh, quite increased uh, information access, and especially for children uh, and adolescents with disabilities, as well as people from uh, who use uh, minority languages and people with low literacy. Um, again, during COVID-19 uh, in Tanzania, uh, when uh, the, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic in Tanzania, we had clients receiving life-saving information, clients with disabilities receiving life-saving information and available assistance in appropriate multiple and accessible formats. Uh, I also have to say, uh, and it's quite very important, uh, engagement with multiple community stakeholders, including parents and caregivers of persons with disabilities, community leaders, religious leaders, uh, who are champions of communicating uh, using these tools and using these tools, uh, championing the use of these tools at community level. So, of course, for within IRC, we've also been able to reach more people with diverse communication needs and preferences. And um, within IRC, uh, in different sectors such as health, women protection and empowerment, child protection and education, there has been increased understanding of the importance of making communication inclusive and accessible for persons with disabilities. 
Um, some of the key recommendations that we would propose or suggest for other contexts, I mean, other country programs or other people um, doing similar work or work in other contexts is that um, it's quite really important to offer multiple uh, forms of communication. For example, use of large print for people with low vision. Uh, easy to read and plain text formats accompanied by diagrams for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, you also have to note that the use of these multiple formats does not only uh, um, uh, benefit persons with disabilities, but even people who uh, have low literacy and even children, and especially if they have uh, pictures or diagrams, uh, diagrammatic representations. Uh, working with local partners has been quite a huge milestone uh, to develop accessible feedback mechanisms and information um, in relevant local formats and languages because the local partners have local understanding of context and local access and acceptance. Uh, again, including images of girls and boys with disabilities among other individuals has uh, been has helped us be able to convey that all members of the community are also involved, including children. Um, and um, it's always uh, very, very important to use tools, as mentioned, in easy to read plain text formats accompanied by pictures and diagrams, uh, because these, as I mentioned, have been able to benefit not only persons with disabilities, but people with no literacy and children. So we've been able to um, develop some of the formats. For example, the, we've been able to, uh, de uh, together with our local partners, develop um, 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 the accessible formats of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has been translated into the local Swahili language, but it also has uh, diagrams of pictorial representations, which are easy to read. So this has been very, very useful because this is one of the documents, but we've also been able to uh, do the same for the uh, National Legal Framework for Persons with Disabilities, that is the uh, Persons with Disabilities Act of 2010 of Tanzania, but also uh, some of the COVID-19 information that we've been able to uh, develop uh, in accessible formats in liaison and in conjunction and in consultation with our partners. Thank you very much. Uh, I will welcome any questions. Perfect. Right. Sorry, Valentina, Thanks. about the uh, sharing full screen. I thought it was a bit of miscommunication. Um, <laughs> we can put up the slides uh, on the platform later for people to view as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Um, so, let us go back to the slides and uh, um, just generally are maybe uh, the last slide on the recommendation and. Uh, um, that was also the uh, the last slide on the presentation before we open to the to the discussion. Um, before we go into the Q and A, and I see that there are already two questions in the Zoom chat. Um, if you don't have a particular questions on the slide so far, and I know it was a lot of communication to just just jump into the discussion right away, uh, we have made a um, slider link um, just to also learn from the um, experience uh, just from the situation that are currently uh, in the organizations uh, that are participating today in this particular session, um, which we can uh, look at uh, maybe in a few minutes once everybody has a chance to look into the slider link. So either if you are able to uh, use uh, your camera uh, to access it through the uh, through the pictorial here or to use the survey link directly to Slido that should also be now available in the chat uh, as far as I understand. Let's take a second uh, to make sure that everybody has access to this and maybe um, after several minutes I will share another screen with the results on that. Um, while we are doing that, um, I don't know if, uh, Kevin, are you on the line? Can you maybe unmute yourself also to, uh, to say a couple of words, but just to let us know that you were able to join? I'm not sure about whether or not Kevin was able to join, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't see him on yeah. that. 
no problem. Yeah, just double checking. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Just to know if the internet connection was good enough in the area. So everyone, I've put the Slido link in the chat. Do do let us know um, if that is if you're able to access that and then complete the brief questions on that Slido poll. I think I will. I will keep my screen shared yeah. to you for a second. If we have any questions in the chat, um, Alice, would you like uh, to invite everybody to comment, and then uh, we take one or two questions sure. while we still have some time? Yeah, and I've noticed, and I'm totally understandable. Um, not not too many comments on our CHS event platform chat. Um, I'm trying to make a note of these um, comments anyway, just so that we, we retain those for, you know, for our learning from the session. Um, but thanks. Uh, I think there's been some great questions. First of all, um, we could touch on uh, one question that's really about beyond uh, integrating Washington Group questions for disability, uh, other other types and tools um, that we've 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 developed and I think um, I hope that Kevin really touched on some of that detail these accessible formats that's really been so critical to our approach and also um, thinking about the various uh, frameworks that we we were trying to approach this work through like the convention for, for persons with the rights of persons with disabilities um, accessible informed consent and interview um, guidance has been really critical. Um, guidance for facilitators of interviews and, and, and FTGs. Um, so some of those are, are examples of how we've seen uh, these adaptations really, really be critical to, to uh, you know, changing our, the way that we're interacting through our accountability mechanisms. There was another question about the time consuming kind of nature of some of these. Um, I, th I thought, Valentina, you might want to touch on that. Um, really, you're overseeing this for ISC globally, but just a, a word on that, really, that I think whilst we are seeing some of these have, have, are time consuming, I think it's important to note that they are a one off, um, in many cases, a one off um, kind of injection of time and effort, right? They take the, the, these tools are things that you do one time and then they have almost limitless uh, impact on, on your accountability mechanisms. Those tools are kind of lasting. Yes, there is time consuming um, elements to ensuring, you know, you've got staff training um, consistently going on to make sure everybody's um, knowledge is, is, is up to the same level about a rights-based approach and then all of these tools. But I would just say that, that once you make these adaptations, you create an accessible format, for instance, like Kevin was talking about in local languages, that's, that's done, that's a one-off kind of injection of time and effort that has that critical impact on your accountability mechanism. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alice. I agree with you that there might be no very quick fix uh, when we think about inclusion and just uh, reviewing our general approach and making sure that from the design on or uh, from the design process of the accountability feedback mechanism that we have we ensure that we create an environment that is accessible uh, for uh, all clients that we serve in the area and uh, we make sure that there are a model of communication and we diversify our um, accountability feedback mechanism uh, based on the input from uh, persons with disabilities, either through the uh, particular um, interactions with them or through the consultations. As Kevin mentioned, it's very important to work with the existing networks and organizations of persons with disabilities that uh, prove to have like extremely and uh, really uh, great input on our everyday work. Uh, in this area. Um, so I will stop sharing the slide and just look into the results so far um, on the on the slide or uh, just to make sure that in the last uh, couple of minutes we have uh, time to look at the uh, results of the pool. I also see that we have around 14 people who have already participated. So let me uh, share the results with uh, everyone. Um, 
Well, I've just there's one comment I'd just make as well, thinking about um, you know how receptive donors might be to some of these adaptations in terms of time and effort, and of course cost resources. I would say that that's uh, where I think rights-based approach can be quite critical if we if we underline the importance of these adaptations from that rights-based approach. You know, I think it's very difficult for for anyone to um, to not see how important those adaptations are. So. That, that would be my advice is that the more we approach these, the, ne the necessity for these adaptations through a rights based approach kind of lens, I think donors um, would be 100% supportive of that when we when we consider that these are about human rights, um, you know, unequivocal. So, um... Just in the last three minutes that we have together, maybe let's look at the results of the quick poll that we had for the Q&A. Um, so the, the first question that we wanted to address is just to see whether um, the staff and the participating organizations um, have a training on the rights-based approach um, and non-discrimination and uh, yeah, as we see, it really becomes more a, a standard already existing investment uh, in the work that uh, we're currently doing in the sector. Um, and this is uh, definitely something that needs to be strengthened further uh, when we look at the services as such, and also in the work that is done around uh, accountability and community engagement as well. Um, even more uh, yeah, results we have on uh, uh, existing organizational policy on accountability to affected population. Uh, this is also a trigger that shows that uh, it should be included in the organizational uh, policy and culture already on this level. And uh, I think that it also has been a development that we have seen in the, uh, um, in the, in the years behind us that uh, this area has been improved a lot. Um, and every organization is now also based on the requirement from donors have this uh, particular area of work in, uh, in the organizations across the sector. Um, it's really, uh, yeah, this question uh, is also more on the focus of our discussion today, uh, whether organizational policy on accountability to affected population reflect equal access by women and men, boys and girls with or without disability. And this is what we're exactly looking into within the ongoing project and uh, general approach at uh, IRC to make sure that these two um, concepts are, are uh, included and implemented uh, at the same time. So if we look at the AAP mechanism, if we look at the community engagement, do we make sure that from the design, from our policies that we have, it is already inclusive? because uh, if it's not already included in the policies that guide our work, most likely it will be uh, more complicated and time consuming for us to make an adaptation during the implementation if it hasn't been included at the design and at the policy level. So uh, this is what we have learned uh, as an organization as well during this, uh, this uh, project that we have. And the last one, uh, do you provide a combination of different feedback mechanisms to address access barriers? Uh, exactly. Uh, so this is one of the uh, biggest learning that we had from the overall process that uh, one uh, feedback mechanism or channel for communication is definitely not enough. We need to be uh, using more uh, combinations of different mechanism channels to make equal access to uh, persons with different communication preferences. Uh, especially based on their uh, feedback and their um, information shared uh, on the channel that they prefer uh, from the organization as such. Um, yeah, and the very last one, which has quite an equal split, uh, do you implement projects in collaboration with organizations of persons with disabilities? So um, again, nearly an equal split on that. And uh, I believe uh, from the experience that we have heard from Kevin from Tanzania, this is a particularly important area for organizations to in, in, uh, invest across the sector and work closer with the existing networks and the uh, local or international organizations on persons with disabilities. I think we are one minute over time uh, and I just tried to keep us to the schedule. So um, 
I don't know from the organizers if we have another minute to have another question from the group or it's time for us to uh, wrap up and uh, continue discussion on the uh, event platform if possible. I didn't see any further questions, Valentina. There is just a comment about the value of training, which um, people are agreeing with. It's very true that you know training is sometimes undervalued, um, and that the kind of guidance notes can be less you know under underused. Um, so very much agree with that. And yeah, just to encourage everyone to use the event platform chat. Um, I, I will share a link. I'm not sure whether it will work for you because it's somehow linked to my. You know my agenda profile on a CHS uh, platform, but um, yeah, do please feel free to continue the conversation. We're really excited to have that conversation ongoing. Um, yeah, I mean, I see we still have uh, over 20 people on the line, so maybe we can. Uh, while we are still in the in the group, uh, we can address another question from the chat. I believe you might still see my screen shared from the uh, Q and A from Slido. So, uh, um, yeah. So uh, maybe I'll just pick the the last one from the anonymous person on what are the best practice um, we've seen. Um, to make sure staff continuously evaluate their actions and interventions uh, to be inclusive. Uh, so uh, this is a very good question and part of the um, training of self-evaluations that we would like to introduce um, on the performance management of staff. So I wouldn't say that there is a uh, best practice overall, but uh, having a uh, focused additional training uh, around the uh, rights-based approach and uh, inclusive design and self-evaluation of whether uh, staff understands uh, in the practical terms how to implement it in their everyday work uh, seems to be a, a good approach so far. Uh, I see another one on um, other tools and processes to understand people living with disabilities. Uh, so just to explain this uh, focus on the Washington group questions, so we have introduced them to make sure that we are able to uh, analyze and evaluate existing uh, activities and services provided so far, uh, because it was the gap for us just in general to use existing information and to disaggregate data that we have nowadays uh, without additional investment uh, in like changing existing practices. Uh, for the additional tools and processes to understand uh, people living with disabilities, as Kevin mentioned, um, we do uh, look into the uh, separate activities uh, to uh, make sure that we have uh, discussions, consultations, and uh, particular meetings with persons with disabilities that have a uh, reasonable accommodation for participation with the uh, interpreters, or if we do the one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, key informant interviews with the uh, easy to read forms and uh, particular activities with them uh, in this regards. But, generally would like to see the situation that we have a universal design for our accountability mechanisms. So uh, everybody can communicate with us at the time and on the topic uh, that they uh, see important and accessible for them. Mm. From Gregory, um, I can't see the question because I see the spool here. Yeah, how have donors uh, responded to your work? Uh, is there any realization on their end of the changes that need to take place? Uh, maybe Alice is better positioned uh, to answer this question, but as I mentioned, uh, this uh, project as such is, uh, was possible with the support from CEDA on particular project that we have on disability inclusive client responsiveness uh, and in the uh, country programs that we have for introduced today with Northwest Syria and uh, Tanzania. Uh, there are also um, additional projects uh, that are focused particularly on the uh, integrating 
better engagement with persons with disabilities. Uh, we have been also working on the um, budgeting tool for more inclusive uh, uh, budgeting uh, templates for our donors as well as well as for organization as such, um, having some additional budget lines for the inclusive design or more accessible uh, environment uh, where RST works. Um, do you know, Alice, maybe? Uh, Hi, other... Valentina. Sorry, I'm just going to bust in. We have only mm -hmm. got about one minute left, uh, and then mm -hmm. some other sessions are going to be starting in the next five minutes, so we do need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Great. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Alice, maybe over to you on the last questions around donor response. But very quickly, I would just say we need to be explicit about those costs in any budget. I think the only time we see donors maybe not receptive to this work is if we kind of wrap up the costs of adaptations that related to accessibility without being explicit about what they are and what they're needed for. Um, so, so wrapping them up, for instance, into other support costs is, is, is can be problematic because donors can cut that can ask to cut those lines, not understanding the detail of what they're needed for. So I just say be very explicit about this, um, the need for this, uh, these adaptations and, and the, the costs associated in that, any budget. I think we better end there. Um, a huge thanks to everyone for joining us today. And we really hope we can continue the conversation as I say on the event chat. Um, Valentina, I'll let you say the final word. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks a lot, Alice. Thanks everyone for participating. Uh, sorry if we were not able to address all the questions. We'll try to take it off uh, line. And yeah, thank you very much for joining. I guess there will be some follow up uh, email conversation after this session today. Thank you and goodbye. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. See you in other sessions later on today. Bye bye.